Hey horror fans, welcome back to room 237. Come at you with another review. <coughs> and my replacement box set has finally arrived. I, I might make a video of this just showing how much better condition it is than the last one. Might not. Uh, but I figured since I'm already halfway through the box set, why not continue? And I'm starting to get into the monsters I'm not super crazy about. Even because I still have Creature from Black Lagoon, which I am interested in. The Invisible Man, which I really like the first one. Haven't seen any sequels. And then this. I've already reviewed the original film, but it's unrelated to the rest of the series. But... Should have just done this first. That is 1940s The Mummy's Hand. Which, of course, part of this. Now, The Mummy's Hand is not a sequel to the 1932 film with Boris Karloff. Instead, it's the beginning of the actual series of The Mummy itself. Um, it came out in 1940. And. It borrows tiny elements of the 1932 film. I think with the original film, it, there was more of romance, more of like a love story. And we really only saw like the undead version of the mummy like in the beginning. Um, but... Uh, a guy committing a huge crime, getting a uh, mummified alive, is the same in this. And the Pharaoh from back then is also called a Menifus. But other than that, it's its own film. And also, this is the first movie with the mummy that every one associates with the character, you know, wrapped up in bandages, kind of walks like this, strangles people. Where Karloff's mummy was named of uh, Hemotep, this one is Karis. And he's, he's actually played by Tom, Tom Tyler. And it was only in this film. For the next four films, he's played by Lon Chaney. And it was directed by uh, a, a Christy Cabody. I hope I pronounced that right. And to be honest, I'm not really the biggest fan of this movie at all. It's, I mean, I, I kind of have to forgive it because it's only, I believe it, it was just over an hour. Yeah, it's only 70 minutes. So it's forgivably short. I, I just thought the movie was slow. Even at 70 minutes, I thought it was really slow. It felt like it took forever for the mummy to appear. Which normally doesn't bother me. I mean, you look at like Frankenstein, Bride of Frankenstein. Like Bride of Frankenstein... Other than the opening, the monster's not in it for like the first half hour, 35 minutes. But that's a good movie. It's a great movie. Maybe I've just never been much of a Mubby fan in general. Even when I was a kid, whether it be the Brandon Fraser movies or Goosebumps. or I was never really just a fan of the Mubby. But I like the Karloff film. And just, uh, I know what they were going for. They wanted this to be more of a straightforward monster flick. But it also felt like they were just really trying to go for humor at the same time. Because you gotta think, 1940, well, even, well, 15 years later, Abbott Costello did the a Meet the Mummy movie, but the 40s, Abbott Costello were big. 
I don't know if that was an inspiration for the two characters. Um, Steve Banning and Babe Jensen, played by Dick Foran and Wallace Ford, respectively. But they really had like an Abbott Costello kind of vibe. And it took up a huge chunk of the film. Well, the film opens up with, there's like this, uh, wait a minute, okay. There's like this old man, an Egyptian named uh, uh, Andoheb, played by George Zucco. He goes to this place, the, the Hill of the Seven Jackals, because the high priest of Karnak, played by Eduardo Cianelli, he's dying and he tells him the story of Karis. And pretty much, uh, Karis was found taking these sacred tana leaves. And I don't even, yeah, because he also wanted to bring back a princess, which the princess in this one is Princess Ananka. Whereas it, in the older film, it was Anka Sandamon. So, kind of similar. And of course, he was found. He was uh, mummified alive without his tongue. And separately, but in the same hole, the ton of leaves were buried. And pretty much, you have to... This is the leaves is like the power source of his existence. Every cycle of the full moon, you have to burn three leaves and I guess give it to him or whatever. And if anyone enters it, oh, because you, you brew it down kind of like a tea, nine leaves will restore the monster. And then we meet Steve and Babe and they're just going through like the marketplace and Steve buys a, a busted vase who thinks it could lead them to the princess's tomb and of course Babe is a goofball not to the not to the full extreme of like Abbott Costello but very similar and so they they bring it to this a museum where uh, Dr. Petrie, played by Charles Trowbridge, says, yeah, this is totally real. And they decide to go. There's this um, sort of like a, a, a magician that's like performing in the area, uh, Slavani, played by Cecil Kellaway. His daughter's played by Peggy Morgan. Morin, excuse me, uh, Peggy Morin. He decides to fund their expedition, so they go. And it takes a long time before anything really starts happening. Like, they find Karis, but no sign of the princess. And anyway, I mean... Eventually, they they bring the monster back and kills a couple of the people. And no, oh, what did I do? Whatever. And I will say the makeup looks great. I do gotta check one thing though, cause I'm not sure if this was. Jack Pierce. Goddamn tablets, I tell you. Yeah, I'm not quite sure if this makeup was done by Jack Pierce. It looks similar. It looks similar to the 1932 film, you know, the dusty, wrinkly old skin. Uh, 
I'm not. I'm not sure if he did. What if I click on the actual character's name? Again, to play by Tom Tyler, Karis. Uh, design. Makeup for Karis was designed by Universal's resident monster, Jack Pierce. Okay. Although when Lon Chaney came in, that, that was when he had a mask rather than customized makeup. Okay. Oh, but for the mummy's hand, Pierce had made a mask for Tyler for long shots. Yeah, I did notice that. Okay. There are some scenes where he looks different. And they did black out the eyes to give him that undead look, which I thought was kind of creepy and effective. I thought that looked really nice. So yeah, this was the only time Tom Tyler played Karis. And, and then basically you kind of get the ending similar to either the original film or the Brandon Fraser one somewhat. But the guy from the beginning that's taken over watching Karis, he decides to... Uh, abduct the magician's daughter and try to use her to bring back the princess of course uh, S Steve and Babe the dumbass they can't catch up every time they shoot him just dust flies off of him because he's immortal and they stop him with fire basically and then it shows them at the end, the survivors, Steve, Babe, the the daughter, and whoever else. They they have the princess's mummy in her her tomb, and they're bringing her back to the states. Yeah, I just I really wasn't the biggest fan of the mummy's hand. It, like, it definitely feels like they're going for more of, like, a traditional monster film. But there's a lot of comedy in it. A lot of comedy that I just didn't find funny. Granted, even though I said it reminded me of Abba Costello, I actually find Abba Costello funny. Like, I love Abba Costello meet Frankenstein. Uh, not really sure why they decided to not continue the Karloff film and start over because the Karloff film you know was considered a classic by that time it did the mummy's hand didn't really receive it was it didn't get as good a, a reception as the Karloff film some people thought you know it it kind of felt like it was trying too hard. It's like they're trying too hard for a monster film, but they're trying too hard to be funny. It didn't have, you know, it didn't have what made the Karloff film what it was, which was a good monster with layers and depth, characters and plot. But also, even the Karloff film had great set design and costumes. It They really did a good job making it look like Egypt. This one... I mean, it could have been filmed in Egypt, but I really didn't, I didn't feel immersed in that atmosphere like I did with Car the Karloff film. And I still got four more films to go. And, you know, I, I guess The Mummy has always sort of been like the red-headed stepchild of the Universal Monster films. I mean, a Creature from the Black Lagoon was like the last monster, even only being in the 50s. 
the Invisible Man people don't really talk about much, but the Mummy just seems to be one that people either don't like as much or kind of make fun of the most. The only real thing I can give uh, uh, the Mummy's hand is the the makeup and the look of the monster. It's Jack Pierce. Can't go wrong. It's going to look phenomenal. It did give us the traditional kind of mummy that strangles people. Just as a movie, it wasn't as strong as the Karloff film. Even though they took several things from it. I just didn't think it was as good. <clears throat> but I got my box set back, which I, my prized possession, my favorite thing of my entire movie collection so I will be continuing with the monster films I might go back and forth between monsters and hammer just kind of bang them out at the same time might not I don't know but that was uh, uh, the mummy's hand and next will be I don't know why I put it back in the box don't want to do that yet next will be the mummy's tomb from 1942 so let me know what you think of uh, uh, this film, uh, The Mummy's Hand, The Mummy in general, and hope you enjoyed the review. Thank you for watching.